Um, when they told me that you were going to introduce the subject to waste of a nation, I was delighted because I thought we were going to talk about Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I thought it's a waste of a nation, a real waste of any nation. But then it, my smugness went away because I realized we're talking about waste of a nation and we're talking about the waste in India. And let me tell you, I have been to many countries in the world, except for probably two countries in the world. We are one of the filthiest, India. And it is really filthy. It makes me feel sad to say it. And a lot of people will tell you, it's unnationalist to say that, but it's truly, it's really true. And it's something I have never understood because is it because are we as Indians really filthy or is it something that is a societal issue? Because if you really look at Indians' homes and houses, they keep them clean. They let you take off the shoes, they keep their houses clean, but it's the garbage on the streets, it's the filth everywhere which I've never understood. And then the other thing which I didn't understand is, is it religious in nature? Because all other religions except the Hindu temples keep the temples clean. Whether it's a church, it's a Jain temple, a Sikh temple, any other, the mosques, everything is clean. It's Hindu temples which are always extremely dirty, garbage piled up all over the place. And then you realize it actually needed a prime minister after 70 years to actually talk about cleaning up a country. And that's what is important because right now what the country needs to understand is that First of all, you clean yourself, and in the act of cleansing is a great economic act. It is also a social act because it actually brings everybody together. Today, the rich can keep themselves surrounded by cleanliness. It's the poor who suffer. It's the kawadiwala, the recycling person who suffers because he's the one who's picking up the garbage that the rest of us throw on the streets. So both, it's an economic impact, it's also a social impact. And there is a lot of money to be made out of garbage. There is today a large number of people large number of companies which have actually technology to do this. But all this we are going to listen from Robin and Catherine with Pragya uh, moderating it. So here's two of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Patnaik. Am I audible? I was asked to project specifically. OK, great. Um, so first of all, um, hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Um, I must say I'm rather pleasantly surprised to see that so many of you have gathered here on this fine evening to listen to us talk about garbage. <laughs> it is uh, not the most savory of uh, topics, but we're going to try and make sure that uh, it's not altogether dull either. And that should not be hard given the context. Any story from India, even if it's a story of garbage, eventually ends up being mind-boggling and darkly fascinating. Unfortunately, more often than not, it also ends up being entirely unfathomable. So I've absolutely no idea where to begin introducing this topic. Perhaps I'll start with um, 1857, and uh, that date should uh, ring a bell if uh, you are familiar with the intersection of history between uh, Britain and India. I read somewhere, I haven't had the chance to uh, verify this independently, so maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it was uh, too good to pass up. So here it is anyway. 10,000 soldiers lost their lives in that first war of independence. I believe 8,500 of them unfortunately died out of um, poor sanitation. And uh, independent and democratic India, of course, has come a long way since. But uh, if you're driving into its capital city, which is Delhi, from its eastern border, you're going to be greeted by an 80 feet high <laughs> landfill looming ominously over the city. As you drive closer, you see uh, bulldozers dwarfed by its enormity rag pickers and scavenging birds as specks on its heights, smoke rising from the numerous fires that are continually burning on this landfill, wafting over the dwellings that are built in the shadow of this precarious mountain of waste. You get the sense that this could collapse any time, and collapse it did last year, merely 1% of it, but even that was enough to claim lives. As an aside, if this dystopic vision does not prepare you for Delhi, nothing ever will. But. Um, Coming back to garbage, India produces, I think, about 100,000 metric tons of waste on a daily basis. And its disposal involves very complex social, cultural, economic, political, and psychological negotiations. Negotiations that Catherine and Robin have written masterfully about in their respective books. And I'm hoping to get them to talk about some of that this evening. Mm -hmm. Catherine, starting with you. Uh, your book is uh, based in a slum in Mumbai called Annawadi. 
and Anavari is uh, surrounded by five star, five luxury five star hotels, which I quote, um, leaves it magnificently positioned for a trafficker in rich people's garbage. So before we dive deeper into this subject, I was hoping you could give the audience a sense of um, the business of waste as you saw it in Anavari. Well, for the people who work in waste in this community, the incredible amount of waste produced by the hotels is, in the words of, of one young man named Abdul Hussein, a fortune beyond counting. That waste is excluded from him. Um, it's handled by the garbage mafias. The waste of travelers at the international airport, which is right across the street from the slum, that's also excluded from freelance waste workers um, in the slum. And if they encroach upon it, they're beaten. Um, they're held in jail, often off the books in jail. So what the workers in waste do in this community is they work on the fringes of one of the great unequal neighborhoods in Mumbai and really of all of India. Um, and before dawn, every morning, and that's every single day of the year, there's no off days for the people who work in this business, even at the height of monsoon, which is starting now. They fan out over this area, um, and they pick up the plastic bottles, the newspaper, the scraps of metal, the wire. Um, and it's fiercely competitive work. It's, there's so many people who want so little. There's so little, you know, that, that people, uh, people battle over it. People kill each other for what's the contents of a recycling bin. It's desperately competitive work. Um, and to do that work, um, the, the scavengers, the rag pickers, they're fully aware, painfully aware, that their lives are going to end early if they do it long enough. Tuberculosis is endemic. Um, cuts become gangrene. Um, maggots, worms, they're aware. But because they're living in a community where so few people have permanent work, that is the work that remains. And they clean up what they can find, and they bring it back in the evening to sell to traders, small-scale traders who do the painstaking work of sorting all this refuse into categories of grades of plastic, colors of bottles, quality of newspapers, and then they in turn transport it to bigger recyclers. Um, it is, I cannot emphasize enough, it is desperate, difficult work, but it is the work that there is. And um, as they do this work to make a living, they're also treated as contagious by their society, which becomes a double discrimination, a, a, a double dehumanization. Yeah. So. I started this, sorry, um, we, we are going to come back. Uh, I'm hoping to return to the yeah. topic of, uh, of uh, the lives of rag pickers. But before we do that, um, I started um, this conversation by talking about the Ghazipur landfill, which is one yeah. of the many landfills in, in Delhi and one of the many, 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 many landfills across mm. India. And at least to my mind, it's preposterous that the Indian government has only recently gotten around to formulating rules regarding uh, collection and sorting and disposal of uh, garbage in urban India. Uh, but even so, the implementation is, uh, and, and enforcement is poor. Robin, I thought maybe you could start out by um, briefly introducing some of the key issues when it comes to waste management in India, because I, I thought maybe there might be people in the audience who haven't read your book and might not be familiar with what <laughs> Yeah, the breadth of yeah. this conversation is. The, that would probably cover the majority of the audience, I think. The, uh, um, the, the rules, India has super rules for waste management, and they're not all that recent. The solid waste management rules were in, uh, first promulgated in the year 2000. They were updated in 2016. And they're a, they're a blueprint of how you should manage waste in a major city. The only problem with those rules is, as with so many rules and regulations in India, they're almost unenforceable. Well, they are unenforceable in a total way. If you talk to professionals who are both environmental scientists and maybe in the commercial business of recycling and waste management, they'll tell you that no local government in India can uh, uh, meet the, the standards of the solid waste management rules. But they are a great target to aim for. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad thing. Uh, the problem, of course, is implementation. 
that comes back to local government because the responsibility for waste management, certainly at the domestic level, and there are other kinds of waste, <laughs> construction and demolition, hazardous waste, toxic waste, these are different categories and require different kinds of treatment. But that level of domestic waste, household waste, is really the responsibility of local governments. And as India becomes more and more urban, uh, in, at Independence, India was maybe 10% urban. Today, it's 40% urban, and the population is nearly four times greater. So there's a huge increase in urban waste, which is one category of the problem that the Swachh Bharat campaign of the current government is trying to deal with. And local governments get the, the dirty end of the job. It's they that are expected to do the tidy up of their, their towns and cities, often without the right resources. And in the case of Delhi, the national capital of ter territory of Delhi has nowhere to go. It's a, a, a bounded community like the Australian Capital ter Territory or Washington, the District of Columbia. It can't go out to its surrounding areas because they're different states and they certainly don't want to see their garbage, Delhi garbage coming into Haryana or Rajasthan or Uttar Pradesh. Yeah. Um, so, well, like Robin said, um, that was a good summary, but there are any number of issues um, for us to discuss if we begin discussing issues relating to waste in India. But at least to my mind, perhaps none of them is as distressing as the role played by rag pickers that Catherine was talking about, kabadi walas as they are known in India. Um, they are involved in sorting waste at every stage of, of the journey of waste in, in India, from the time it's collected from homes uh, to its ultimate destination, whether it's treated or just dumped untreated, whatever the case might be. And um, they, I mean, just in, as an example, in, in, in Delhi itself, they end up recycling about 15 to 20% of the waste, saving the municipalities um, a, about a crore every month. But what they end up earning is, of course, just a couple of thousand rupees, if they are lucky, and not to mention the conditions under which they work. It just cannot be emphasized enough. Um, and then there are, of course, those who enter our sewage gutters to clean them manually. And these are very widespread practices in every town, every city in India, unfortunately unabated. I'd like both of you, and Catherine, you did talk about it very briefly in, in, the, previous, uh, as an, uh, you know, in the previous answer, but I'd like both of you to talk a little bit more about the lives of these people, the substances they get addicted to in order to cope, the accidents and, and the sort of diseases that they're vulnerable to. Well, when, one, thing that, one thing that really fascinated me that I didn't know about until I did my um, research over the course of years uh, in these communities was how intimately connected the workers' livelihoods were to the global markets. When I first mm. came into um, the Mumbai slums and started following people who, who made a living on recyclable garbage, it was in 2008, and their incomes were at highs that they had never previously anticipated, and that was because of uh, the Olympics in Beijing and all the construction surrounding that had lifted the price of their scrap to an all-time high. And then 10 months later, investment banks start to collapse in New York. And all of a sudden, people who just, just begun to, to, to have a little bit more income and a little more dignity, the bottom fell out of their world. Um, absolutely catastrophic. And that happened all over the world. Um, of course, you know, so many of these things have happened. There are no journals to document. There's no, you know, so it's, it's these, these hidden connections. And the, the workers in Anawati slowly, slowly over time, inched away up over years, only to see the bottom of their uh, worlds collapse again because of the financial crisis in 2015 in China, their former rescuer. When the price of crude oil falls, the price of the plastic they collect becomes worthless. So the picture I'm trying to create is of people who are working just as hard every day, but the results of that work in this intricately connected global economy are completely different. And those, you know, their livelihood depends on decisions made by consumers and corporations a world away. And yet, yet of course, people look at them and watch them and expect them to be entirely consistent in how hard they try. And that's the, you know, the reality of these workers. Um, all over the world, and it's, um, it's, it's that kind of dev volatility takes a tremendous toll on families and on communities, just a devastating. Um, there, there was a, a young man in Murchi Hussein, and he one day described his community 
surrounded by these luxury hotels. He said, everything around us is roses, and we're the shit in between. Mm. And the private title for my book was The Shit in Between, <laughs> because it was, it, you know, it, you can just, if you think about that, you know, it just gets to the, the damaging, the corrosive effects of inequality in unequal communities, um, where a young man like Murchie can be describing as shit the only place he's ever lived, the home to virtually everybody he loves. And I don't think we think as much as we should about the psychological toll of inequality. Um, yeah. it, I was hoping to come back to that, but Robin. No, I was going to say, it is a global, it's Absolutely. a global problem. The interconnectivity yeah. of waste is striking. I suspect in Britain it hasn't quite hit the China's national sword policy, which was introduced in a big way from January of this year. China will no longer take virtually all the waste that it has been taking for the last 25 years. In Australia, that's led to a local government crisis because there is nowhere for plastic and paper to go. And as it piles up, it becomes fire hazards. So Australian governments, both at the state and the national level, are hugely moved by this and now putting tens of millions of dollars into stopgap methods to try to introduce an ability of Australia to, re to remake paper, for example. We've lost a lot of our capacity to do that. And also to reuse plastic. Those are just two examples. But with waste and recycling, it, I think there's a wonderful book that was done 25 years ago at the University of Arizona called Rubbish. And it was a, an archaeological uh, project that actually did uh, core samples of garbage tips. <coughs> And they one of the conclusions these guys came to was that waste has to be, if you're going to recycle, it has to be sorted, it has to move, it has to go on a, little, a lot of little stages to be, become something else. And at the end of it all, somebody has to make a buck. And it's the making of the buck that is the, often the big problem and certainly imposes so much hardship and disadvantage on the people at the very bottom end of that movement who do the initial picking up. I'd, I'd like to stay with these people for a minute more. Um, and this discussion would be incomplete if we didn't talk about caste, mm -hmm. um, to my mind. Um, most of the manual sca scavengers in India, if not all of them, are Dalits uh, who are outcasts in the caste hierarchy that continues to deeply divide Indian society. Um, Robin, would you like to talk a little bit mm -hmm. about uh, the significance of this fact? Yeah, I, I think. I think if the Swatch Bharat or Clean India campaign is to succeed, that is, it, if India is to become noticeably cleaner in the next five years, the next ten years, it will also, it has to at the same time undermine caste and yeah. undermine some of the practices and behaviors that go with caste. Because uh, as Pragya was saying, if you're not a Dalit and you touch waste, you'll be treated like a Dalit. And many, many of the people who actually pick up are very poor Muslims, or they may be displaced people from the countryside, probably low status people. But nevertheless, once you're doing waste, you become a Dalit to all intents, so for social purposes. And being a Dalit still brings with it terrible kinds of penalties. In January 2016, there was uh, a crisis at the University of Hyderabad when a student who was a, claimed to be a Dalit, and I think was a Dalit by any definition, uh, committed suicide because of this kind of discrimination he was facing in pursuing his PhD studies. And that was a big story for a number of days. Um, on the same day that it broke in the Hindu newspaper, there was a small story in the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the front page of the Chennai edition of four guys uh, who were cleaning a cesspit for a hotel. Because hotels claim to have septic, septic tanks, what they very often have are just big concrete set, uh, cesspits where nothing much happens biologically. You just end up with a very full tank of very awful material. Anyway, these guys had been called by their boss, who was a subcontractor of a subcontractor, to clean the tank. And one of them went down the manhole or the uh, workman hole at the top of the tank, didn't come back. Second one went in after him, he didn't come back. Third one went in, he didn't come back. And when the fourth one didn't come back, they called the fire department and they pulled out four dead men. And they were, of course, they were Dalits. They'd gone down without the right equipment. And the organization in Delhi, run by a remarkable man called Beswada Wilson, um, they claim 1,600 deaths in similar circumstances in the last five or, t 
five or ten years. And they're, they're fairly common. You don't have to read an Indian newspaper very long to he read of a death uh, involved in cleaning a cesspit or cleaning a so-called septic tank. So caste is uh, one of the things that needs to be undermined. How, that go how that's to happen is a, a very difficult question, but if the Clean India campaigns to succeed, it will succeed as caste is eroded. They will march in step, I think. Very quickly, Catherine, is, is, uh, do you feel that uh, the relationship between manual scavenging and caste has been weakened to some extent in the urban context? And I was also wondering how religion and caste, something that he mentioned, into, you know, interplay with sort of in, in, in Anavari. Well, I think that your description of it, Robin, is exactly what my own reporting indicated, is that by there, there are more people doing the work now than the traditional uh, caste groups like the, the Matangs. More people are coming in, but once they start to do that work, they become you know, effectively yeah. to other oh, people. Contemptual. One of the things that I think is really missing in the Modi, there's, you know, the Modi government is really good at messaging and less good at follow through. But one of the things that is really missing in the campaign for cleaning up India in time for uh, the Gandhi's 150th birthday in uh, 2019 is, is a campaign to, to start, to, to encourage the citizens to start being the people who handle the trash mm -hmm. of the middle class and the, the wealthy, not as public health hazards, but as part of the public mm -hmm. health solution. I think it's an essential thing. I think it's a doable mm -hmm. thing. It's a message that needs to get out. Mm -hmm. um, because of this, my, uh, a young man um, known for years who, who is a, a collector of trash named um, Sunil Sharma, he's, he's actually from a carpenter caste in UP, but he's treated as mm -hmm. because he is doing the work. He said to me one day, he said, I feel like an insult doing this work. And he's not saying, I'm insulted doing this work. He's internalizing. He's actually embodying it. He feels like an insult. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's the way he's treated by the people whose streets he helps keep clean. And that's a fundamental mm -hmm. injustice and disconnect um, that needs to be addressed just as much as um, the building of toilets. Um, there's, you know, um, you can you can reduce cleaning India to to toilets, the th kind of things that you can count, but you also have to deal with these deep prejudices and dishumanizations, you could call them, that um, that affect the people who do that work. Yeah, that's a, that's a point that Beswada uh, Wilson makes as well. Sorry, if I may, um, I was going to bring this up, the Swachh Bharat campaign, up a little bit later, but since it's come up. I'm just going to try and maybe introduce it uh, briefly to the audience if they're not aware of it. This is one of uh, Prime Minister Modi's pet schemes. It's called the Swachh Bharat Campaign, which is uh, the Clean India Mission. And uh, it is focused on essentially eradicating open defecation <laughs> by uh, building toilets all over the country. And uh, critics argue that uh, simply building toilets is not enough to uh, solve the sort of complex tangle of issues mm -hmm. that underpin uh, the problems with waste management in India. And, um, you know, for example, uh, uh, toilets are of little use, even if you build them, if there is no access to water, which is a major problem in India, no access to septic tanks, which mm -hmm. even five stars sometimes don't have access to, um, like Robin was saying earlier, um, uh, without modern sanitization systems, uh, because then again you come back to the same people having to clean those toilets, etc. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, and then there's the problem of behavioral change, like she was saying earlier, Catherine was saying earlier, that uh, they're good at messaging, but, uh, you know, the picking up of the messaging doesn't quite always translate. And what makes matters worse is there's a massive opportunity cost of the thousands of crores that is being pumped into this scheme. Um, I, uh, we touched upon it earlier, and we spoke about it from the perspective of caste and the people who work uh, with sanitation, um, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to ask uh, you guys to maybe talk a little bit more about where you see this mission headed and do you see it succeeding in any way, in an in impactful way? The, 
the, the Swatch product has had hundreds of millions of equivalent US dollars put into it so far. And a lot of it, but not all by any means, has gone into the campaign against open defecation. And that, it's a cam it, that particular campaign is a, a kind of obvious one because it appeals to managers because you can count them. You, if you go to the Swatch Bharat rural page on the website, you'll see there's a ticker there. And the ticker's always ticking over telling you that the, the toilets are being built even as you're reading the web, the web page. Uh, the problem, of course, is that this is top-down driven. And uh, bureaucrats everywhere know how to meet targets. Bureaucrats in India are masters at meeting targets. But whether the, uh, whether the actual result is a workable, sustainable toilet that's been built, that's, another, that's one matter. And the other is, of course, to induce people to use them. Because uh, a smelly, awful toilet is uh, no improvement over a nice tree in a pasture uh, 50 meters from your house, uh, <laughs> except on a very, very rainy monsoon day. But. One of the things that you know, we, we often consider things like waste separate from issues of joblessness or is issues of public health. And, and if, you, if you look at it from the point of view, open defecation, from the point of view of somebody who is a daily wage worker for every half hour they don't work, that's income for their family that they lose. And you have a choice. You can find a place to relieve yourself every day that is clean and decent. And maybe it, it's an hour away from your home. Are you going to do that, or are you going to do what you have to do so that you can go out and feed your families? Um, these are deeply connected issues. And, and no woman that I've met in um, the communities where I work wants to be defecating out in the open. Um, they do that because, and, and it's a daily stress for them. Mm. And it's like, it requires an enormous amount of intellection that could otherwise be put into so many more productive ways of, you know, of, of living and earning for their families. And, um, but that is the situation that, you know, 50% of people in UP face on a daily basis, many, many people in uh, communities in the slums of Mumbai. And so, in it, you know, one of the things that was really striking to me, I, I started asking people um, in advance of this session in various villages, I said, have you got a toilet? And people sent me back pictures. I sent you one. And it was of a single bowl lying on its side in a UP village, Dharmapur. Jampur, and it had been sitting there for a year. It was disintegrating. That toilet no doubt met a target. <laughs> um, but it had absolutely nothing to do with increased well-being of the community. Um, and I think, but, but, but the really interesting thing that I learned when I started asking people is that the message about shame has gotten through. So people are more ashamed mm -hmm. now to defecate in fields or on the sides of roads. So the shame is increased, but the solutions, mm -hmm. the access to a more dignified way of relieving yourself mm has -hmm. not increased. And that's like that's the subtler kind of tragedy. The, the, the interesting comparison is that in Kerala state, down in the mm -hmm. southwest, Kerala is about 90% toilet equipped, 90% of Kerala households. But that's got a lot to do with uh, three generations of almost universal primary education, uh, with reasonable primary schools, high levels of female literacy that grandmothers, great-grandmothers were reading mag weekly magazines with home sanitation hints in the 1940s and 50s. That makes a difference. Bangladesh has a better record in the two key aspects of this open defecation question. It's got it's much more heavily toileted. Bangladesh is nearly 90% of households mm. have toilets, um, not necessarily great toilets, but at least containing ex excrement and providing privacy. And uh, the other side of it, of course, is that there is, seems to be a direct connection between open defecation and childhood stunting. That India has a worse record of childhood stunting than Bangladesh. Not by a lot, but significant, uh, by a margin of 4 or 5%. These are studies that can be questioned on their methodology, but nevertheless, the UN studies, the same methodology is applied in different parts of the world. And that's an int it's a terrible public health hazard. When we think about this, John Snow found the Broad yeah, Street yeah, pump, what, yeah. about a mile from here in 1854, yeah, yeah. the one that was purveying cholera to the whole city of London. Yeah. Uh, and that was the beginning of an understanding of germ theory, which the Germans later demonstrated. Also natural experiments, which eventually led to 
the invention of RCTs, which are yeah. older age, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, since you mentioned the link between open defecation and uh, childhood stunting, um, and again, this could take this answer could take an hour, so we'll have to be brief and you know do what we can. Uh, but um, I would like to get a sense of why this conversation is important, right? And uh, what I'm trying to get at is the impact of India's failure to deal effectively with its waste is obviously not just limited to the people who work with that waste. It, it, it is a larger public health issue, environmental issue. Could you talk a little bit about the range of impacts that we're talking about, which also varies with the range of waste that we're talking about? I'm thinking of burning landfills and burning, burning tips. Um, the landfills around Delhi and Mumbai. Mumbai had a big landfill fire, I think, two years ago, uh, which had everybody choking for a, a, a length of time. So unscientific, unscientific, there's things called scientific landfills. Unscientific landfills uh, emit dangerous gases and catch fire. Uh, that's just one. The air pollution is worsened by bad waste management. That's just one aspect. And of course, with open defecation and the relationship to stunting, it's about babies having internal parasites and the parasites competing for nutrition with the child's body. And that's what leads to stunting. That affects, apparently, the wealthy in the countryside almost as much as the, uh, the poor in the countryside. So it's a kind of, you know, the flies aren't reading the bank statements when they land on the food uh, in the kitchen or that's been put out, put out to waste, uh, or put out to uh, eat or cool. The, uh, so this public health question, I, I think, is one that has the potential to unite people if it were more widely understood, that we all have an interest in keeping a cleaner environment around the house. But to make that pervasive in rural areas, I think, is much more difficult. In the, the life expectancy in the slums in Mumbai must be terribly low. I, I noticed that you, you mentioned 55. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, but in... in my experience it was lower. Lower still. And, and, yeah. and, and the, you know, the people who were doing that work, they kept a tally of who was going to be the next to die. And it was routine for people mm. to die of pernicious lung infections or gangrene at you know, age 20, age 25. Um, and it was, again, it was like you know, this, there's this idea that people who do that work are oblivious to it. They don't care. They are painfully, painfully aware that they're shortening their lives by doing this That's labor. Right. Actually, this is uh, this has come up a couple of times already in in, in what you've been saying. But I um, I'm hoping that y you could spend a couple more minutes talking about um, something that really intrigues me, which is the psychological impact that goes beyond the public health and environmental impact of living around and on waste. And and it's interesting because in your book, it's not just waste is not just a reality. It's also a, a recurring metaphor, right, in, in, mm. in many different ways. But it's, you know, when, when people from outside refer to some of the, the workers in waste, they're not calling them workers in waste, they're calling them garbage. Like, they cut out the worker part, they call them trash. And so uh, people who do this work and born to it, they, you know, people like Abdul Hussein, who I mentioned earlier, who's been doing this kind of work his whole life, has been called garbage his whole life. And that absolutely affects the, the way that you carry through, carry yourself through a society, through slum, slum lanes. But one of the things that really fascinates me and horrifies me in um, that the people who, who are doing this, this work in waste, they are also, even, even people in the community who aren't waste workers, are victims of the illegal dumping of waste because that's the mm. thing that we know about waste is that it travels downward. <laughs> when people want to get rid of what they can't sell, they're not dumping it in Knightsbridge. They're not dumping it in Bandra. They're dumping it in communities where the people can't protest. And so what you see in, in, in the community where I work, it's very shape. Um, it's very nature. It's very geography was shaped by illegal waste. There was a huge pool of dumped petrochemicals and sewage that were the effluents of the most beautiful international airport in the world, in Mumbai. To make that airport involved creating this cesspool in that community. And at the same time, all around the slum, there were huge mounds of dirt and garbage, also from the, building the airport. And every time it rained, it turned that community into, you know, uh, people drowned in that community because of the, the, the waste dumping. The diseases were rampant because of the water collecting there. And so the contours of life were set by 
the problem of waste in India. So they made a living on it, and it, it determined their destiny. So there are obviously many different parts of this puzzle, as, is, is, as I hope uh, you can see. But one of the more darkly fascinating ones is um, the garbage mafia that Catherine earlier mentioned. And the garbage mafia, of course, had a lot to do with the fire as well in, in Mumbai. I don't know how many countries, uh, other countries outside of India still have a garbage mafia. The U.S. for um, sure. The U.S. for mm -hmm. sure. Italy. Italy definitely. Mm -hmm. But, but it, in India, it's, it's uh, still very powerful and as you can imagine, very, very disruptive. Um, what were your encounters? Like, did you encounter the garbage mafia in any way or, or how did it come up uh, during your research? I'd like both of you to perhaps, uh, or, or just tell, you know, maybe perhaps give the audience a sense of how they work. Well, I mean, I, you know, the, the, when David Chase uh, wrote, conceived of The Sopranos, it wasn't an accident that Tony Soprano was in the waste management business. It's a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's mobbed up around the world. And for the people in a community like Anawadi, they were, they understood that, that their lives would be at risk if they tried to move on garbage that might be sought after by these companies that, it, you know, at the hotels, for instance, the companies paid under the table money to the hotels to get the contracts to um, haul away the garbage. And, and you simply understood your city to be places where they were, there were, it was, their mental maps were full of red lines. You cannot go to this place because it's controlled. So the people who worked had to go often further and further afield to find uh, places to collect garbage that weren't already claimed by the people who dominated field and that you know again it was a you know it was a it was a corruption driven economy payoffs and private agreements that they had no hope of they didn't have the capital to participate in it so they had to to be I mean they were marginalized people with smaller and smaller margins of um, space where they could collect waste and sell it we got the impression and it may be not correct that big mafia in garbage in India was less prevalent than say it has been in the United States at different mm. times or is in Italy. Um, my friend Asadoron, uh, who I worked with, um, he spent some time in Sweden in the Netherlands talking to people there. In Sweden, of course, I think most of the stuff we throw away today will end up on a barge tonight going to Sweden to feed their incinerators. And Sweden buys in rubbish from around Northern Europe to feed its incineration system, which provides heating and a certain amount of electricity. But when Asi asked uh, the general manager who was showing him around one of these incineration plants, um, you don't buy any garbage from Italy? And he said, no, I don't want to get killed. The, uh, so, I mean, he was, he was partly being, I think, swaggering a bit, but nevertheless, there was an element of truth behind it. They, uh, so. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, because we're talking about uh, mounting waste, uh, and this is something that you sort of uh, write about: um, how the practices of frugality and and husbanding have given way to consumerism in India and, and a sort of throwaway culture, and you kind of link the mounting garbage to that. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think if one's looking for um, bright aspects of the Indian challenge to manage waste, because as we said earlier, every country in the world has got a big, big challenge, I think, on now. But uh, the, uh, one of the brighter aspects is that India is only a generation away from a time when the lady teachers in my school in Chandigarh 50 years ago used to spend recess darning socks if they weren't knitting jumpers. Well, who darns a sock in India today? I don't think many people darn socks except many grandmothers. But there was that frugality that came of the controlled economy of a largely rural society where stuff just got reused and used in other ways. Uh, that's only just started to disappear, and a lot of the old kabaris um, are the children of the old kabari, the old door-to-door um, -door waste collector, have developed little businesses themselves, I think, on the basis of that. But I, I don't know, Catherine. What yeah. I mean, it's very hard to tell people in poor communities that they, I mean, I, I personally believe that it's reuse and reduce is the only way that we can mm. you know, solve this. this problem of waste, but it's very, very hard to tell low-income people who see wealth at every side that they shouldn't want the same things that, that wealthier people have. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, when we talk about growth in India, it's, it's always a hot-button topic. Um, but you kind of really write wonderfully about growth in your book. Um, and I think I have a quote um, somewhere over here. Um, 
The slum dwellers in your book speak, and I quote, of better lives casually as if fortune were a cousin arriving on Sunday, as if the future would look nothing like the past. Yet, for every two people in Anavari inching up, there was one in a catastrophic plunge. Could you talk a little bit about what unequal growth looks like from the inside? Um, I mean, I think what I, what I would emphasize is that in, in any society, the United States, the UK included, when legitimate means of social mobility break down, people are going to find other means. And so what you see in unequal societies, poor communities, you see a lot of, a lot of risk taking, a lot of violence, a lot of desperation because you want what other people have. You, you think you have a chance to get to the middle class. If you can't find the ladders, you're going to find other means. You're not going to sit on your hand and sacrifice uh, the potential of your child to, to get an education and to, to better her life. But that creates a lot of conflict inside poor communities. And there, we, I think with, that we have, that, that there's been habitually this sort of sentimentalized version of low-income communities of everybody helping each other and um, supporting in each other. I think we see that less and less when people see so close to them what they might have that might radically change the options for their children. Um, and, you know, it's so, so in, you know, it is, it is for, for the people in the communities who I'm talking to, they're not, nobody's nostalgic for pre-91. You know, where, nobody's nostalgic for a time when everybody was equal in their misery. Um, people want better for themselves, but to, to, to make that happen involves an awful lot of stress and conflict and in, in a situation where there really is no safety net. Part of what I try to describe in my book, for instance, is the public hospital where there, there was a saying about Cooper Public Hospital, which served hundreds of thousands of people. If you go to Cooper, you go Uber. You know, it's like that, you know, the institutions like the, like the, um, the police where people would see someone dying in the road and they'd be afraid to turn to the authorities because of the capriciousness, because they could be held. They could be um, held and extorted for money. There was a, you know, so the, the pe people were working so hard and the institutions that were supposed to help them were actually creating more volatility in their lives. And, and that volatility is, there's a, there's a romance about the ingenuity of, of low-income communities, but when your life is that volatile, over time, it's corrosive. People cannot keep chasing that bus without eventually growing tired, without eventually growing hopeless about their chances to um, to succeed in an economy that they feel is very much rigged against them. And this is the conundrum, right? Somewhere mm. that the growth is, I mean, waste and pollution is an externality of growth. And mm. yet growth and structural change are key. Uh, equal growth, at mm. least, uh, uh, you know, is key. If, if people have to be pulled up the poverty line, if they have to be given opportunities and education, because the poor are also the most vulnerable to climate change, to, mm. uh, to pollution, of course, and to uh, all uh, diseases, etc. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on where the balance lies between growth and this particular externality of growth. Well, there's a certain amount that can be done through regulation, uh, limiting plastic bags, that that kind of thing, sure. but that does really very little. Um, I think where you, where you see in India the uh, p things that look, look promising are where there have been effective primary education for a number of generations, and there's, there's really, and that it, it, particularly girls' primary education. I keep coming back to Kerala for that, these sorts of examples where there's been universal primary education for more than three generations, uh, almost universal literacy, and better public health as a result, simply because mothers demand better for their children. They know about boiled water. They know about hand washing. Um, now, this is basic, but it's also very difficult, it seems, to deliver that regular universal primary education in some parts of India even today and that, that's it seems it's kind of a cliche to say it you know education is the key it's not the key but it's one of many keys it's this is a multiple lock that one would like to unpick yeah. uh, sorry how, how much time do we have okay okay I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask um, uh, one quick question to Catherine which is um, that, uh, of course, a lot of the issues that we've spoken about are uh, connected with related policy and governance issues, as I'm hoping is obvious. <laughs> but um, 
corruption is also a big part of the puzzle as it is in, in most things in India. But Catherine, you come away with a very uh, interesting and a very nuanced understanding of what corruption means in India and, and why it's sort of significant in India. Would you care to talk about that a little bit? Well, one of the things that became clear to me in within communities is that people saw that, that you know, that, that so many of the opportunities that they had on paper didn't exist in reality. And so for people who were enterprising, they saw corruption itself as, as an opportunity to get ahead. Um, and, and so to them, and, 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 and I will never forget the evening that a, a, a woman named Asha Vagakar was, was explaining to me why she was involved in a program that essentially created fake schools and paid off people in um, politicians and their families, and there were, were no schools. <coughs> and I said to her, so how do you justify it? And she said, why is it my corruption if the big people say that it's right? And I think that is, I mean, I, I think about that all the time in the United States. I think that's a, you know, I mean, this is the message that people are getting from their leaders in this particular moment. Uh, um, you know, if, if, if you can't win fairly, cheat. Um, if you can get it, take it. Um, that, you know, this idea that democratic norms are as bendable as Q-tips. It's just, um, this is the message that people are, are hearing and ideas trickle down in communities sometimes faster than wealth does. Okay, I did want to ask both Robin and Catherine about uh, solutions for the future, but perhaps um, we'll open it up now and one of you can... Ask the solutions. Ask, the, ask for solutions. <laughs> <laughs> Not, uh, no, no pressure. Um, the lady in front, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was, I was exactly. Are there any good um, stories of how this can be managed properly? properly, particularly maybe involving technology and also involving the private sector. I know it's a dirty word, mm -hmm. but the government obviously doesn't have enough money. Um, how can we properly use, not the private sector as you're talking about, of course they're a big part, but how do we bring that into the big private sector and get them to try and solve the problem as well? I just, I'll just mention one thing that, that um, has made me optimistic on this subject just in the last um, few months is that in, in Kerala, there's a startup that has um, created a, a robot to do manual sewage cleaning. It's called Bandicoot. Yes. And it is, um, right, a great name. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked as a trial in one community. And um, the government has, has declared it successful. And it's now rolling out in, um, soon in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's something still to be studied. But this, you know, this kind of thing could effectively liberate uh, uh, many, uh, you know, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people from doing this work. But solutions like that only work if the society is ready to allow people who've done that work over generations to find different ways of making a living. So again, it all leads back to caste, and it all leads back to you know, the idea that, that you know, that there is no empathy without equality, that people have to be treated with dignity and, um, you know, and equality, because otherwise, what will the people do uh, who um, have been historically dehumanized and stigmatized? So can they cook food? Will people buy it? Um, you know, this reintegration of people who are, quote, liberated from this work um, will not necessarily be a beautiful thing unless um, Unless there's there's aggressive messaging and policy, we messaging can change societies. It's you know the leadership can um, can change the views of individuals. We see it all over the world, um, and it's just the question of what message the um, what message will com will will complement the kinds of technology like Bandicoot that could uh, that could save a lot of people from early death and stigma. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to add? add uh, well, on you the, saw the rest yeah. of it. <laughs> the, uh, on the technology thing, there's uh, very basic technologies help. For example, the carts that go down that are pulled by hand down very narrow gullies in uh, big cities, um, often just an old modified cycle rickshaw with puncturable, ch you know, uh, air tires so that they puncture. Um, they've developed, uh, it's not particularly high tech, 
but a nice little cart that rolls, and it's on polyurethane wheels, the same as roller skates. Far easier, far better to maintain, easier to sort the waste on the cart, easier to pull. Now that's at, that's at the bottom end. At the top end of technology is the one that India needs to be very careful with, and that's high combustion incineration. These big plants that keep Japan and Singapore and Northern Europe clean are um, extremely expensive. They require constant maintenance, and they require high quality dry waste. And that we have one at Okla in Delhi, which I think the people who own it would say it's working just fine, but I don't think the people who live around it would say it was working all that well. Um, but that kind of, uh, Australia too is just beginning to dip its toe into high combustion incineration. But it's, a, it's for very special cases, and the tech solution is not a solution. It's a part, it's another key that would, in certain circumstances, provide, like the, the smaller, small tech is probably better than big tech, because I think small solutions in small approaches to waste management in India, at the level of domestic waste, are better than big approaches. Uh, toxic waste, hazardous waste, construction and demolition, that's a different set of categories. Gentlemen of that. Such a fascinating insight, and it's also very salutary. Can I just go back to this um, issue, the corrosive issue of corruption? You mentioned the messaging is all fine, but, but the follow-through isn't. Mm -hmm. What is your take on the, can you just amplify that, and, and whether, whether, we're, whether people are putting money where their mouth is and, and what the present administration is doing? Well, well, I would say that as a, as a journalist, I have a, a bias for accountability and reporting. Um, and so you have, you have, I mean, for instance, the toilet targeting and, and the, you know, why is that, so it's a grand success on paper, but there's very little exploration of what's actually happening in communities. And governments understand that. They understand that nobody's going to go back and check. So there's no incentive to make sure that, the, you know, that, that, well, I mean, and as I said before, that it can actually be counterproductive. You can create shame in people because of your messaging without giving them the resources and the access to the toilets that would give them dignity. So it can be a very painful thing. And, and how do you create mechanisms of accountability for, for people who have no political power? I come down in the Frederick Douglass side of things, which is that power concedes nothing without a demand, ultimately, and, you know, and part of Part of the problem of creating a demand and for accountability in those communities is caste, because people aren't necessarily who are low income and are suffering. They are not necessarily coming together to fight for their interests. They're often um, yes. fighting separately. They're narrowing themselves down. Um, but I do think that that you know that it's the citizenry that is. It's not going to be the NGOs. It's going to be the citizenry that holds people accountable. And I'm interested. One of the things I'm interested in tech is the ways in which tech can create better feedback loops for people in poor communities so that they're able to get their message across that what has been promised has not been fulfilled um, and to get attention for that. Uh, so much of journalism in, you know, all over the world in poor communities is centered on big cities. And there's a whole world out there that simply will never make it to the public record unless, unless we find better ways of, of letting those voices be heard. Um, sorry, if I may, uh, a particularly horrifying example of what uh, Catherine just spoke about, where the message goes out without resources, is of uh, this, the tale of this young man who, inspired clearly by all the messaging, decided to call out uh, three drunk men who were urinating in the suburbs of Delhi and was killed. And uh, his family has still seen no justice, no compensation. So, you know, there we go. Um, any more questions? Sorry, there was a hand up at the back. Sorry to. Over there, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, really interested to hear your opinions. Um, from personal experience and organizations that I've worked with in India, I think the question of the, the role of the private sector, I think it's actually the social enterprise space where there's a lot of traction in this area, whether that's eco sand toilets in Tamil Nadu and, and the creation of fertilizers and, that, and the closed loop of an enterprise, but also with a social mission to organizations in Dili working with rag pickers to collect plastic and turn those into luxury goods, luxury handbags, for example. In, your, in the work that, and the research that you've done, have you seen um, signs of that kind of social entrepreneurship? And 
the, the challenge of taking that to scale. Yeah, that's, I think that's it's one of the, the hopeful aspects that this goes on a lot. When, the ones I'm thinking of, I'm not sure that I'd call them social engineering. It's more sort of slightly off the books enterprise. Um, the plastic factories where they're, uh, what are the ones I've been shown are in the southeastern Calcutta that run in little, little shacks in a slum area where they've got the extruding equipment to chop up a plastic, set of plastic bottles, turn them into chips, and then remake them into door frames and so on. And all with free electricity tapped off the grid. With, uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, but that's, that's one example. But you know, there are more formal and much better examples. And that's one of the nice things, that there are patch, patchy examples of these kinds of activities all around the country. But what you say, I think, is right. How do you join them together? How do you upscale them? Any, any other questions? Do we have time for one more? OK. Uh, sure. Well. Actually, it's an observation rather than a question. <laughs> Do you just... uh, India, the lo what you call the poorer people can't live without plastic. Their homes, the doors are plastic. The cots they sleep on is plastic. The utensils they use is plastic. So banning plastic is out of the question. But recently, I saw a video clip in YouTube of a professor in Madurai University who is using plastic as a coating for gravel while laying roads. Apparently, Dr. Abdul Kalam had also seen it. And these roads are much more lasting than the ordinary roads. Would it, I think, if this is taken as a national level, I think plastic problem could be solved by and large. The other question, thing I wanted to say is, if you say shout, if you keep shouting Swach Bharat, Swach Bharat, somewhere it leaks in. I've been traveling in South India a lot these days. And I found a lot of villages have become really clean, but they don't know what to do with their non-destroyable waste, as mm. they call it. Mm. That mm. is a problem. The destroyable waste, they found waste. Mm. But Swachh Bharat has a meaning. Though I am not, uh, I am not a supporter of Modi, mm. but I still say mm. that man at least understood that there were no toilets in India. Till then, the previous rulers in Delhi, the Latins Delhi, did not know that there were toilets. In, there were no toilets in India. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? Questions? No? Oh, my pub's open. Oh, one over there. Okay, sorry, sorry, I couldn't. Yeah, sure. It's just really a uh, question about how much attitudes have to change at, at all levels. And it was just an observation. I went to Bikaner recently for the first time. And the young man who was showing me around said, oh, it's amazing that you love this place so much. All the other visitors I meet say it's so dirty. So I mentioned this to, some, to, the, to um, the person who was hosting me. And he said, well, the middle classes throw all their trash down. But now that there's been some enfranchisement of Dalits and they're no longer picking it up, it just stays in the streets. It's a very superficial observation. But I'm just thinking that the changes have to come from so many parts of society to just have a basic respect, not just for the other people, but even for your own streets. It just seems like an intractable problem at that level. But mm. anyway, so do any final comments, Rob and Catherine? I, I don't think so. I think the, the, the one I'd make is that the, there are so, it's not just India's problem. I mean, India copes with special problems, and I think caste is very special <laughs> to India. But Australia, um, certainly uh, much of Northern Europe, copes with the same, uh, the same sorts of questions. And it's going to become more acute if China no longer wants the recyclable stuff, because that's going to have to go somewhere. And this may be a good thing, because it may lead to local initiatives. And the closer you deal with waste to where it's produced, the better. The, you don't want it to move very far. Any final comments, Kazra? Just before I came, I, I was looking at a map of human waste on the streets of San Francisco and how it had absolutely skyrocketed in the mm -hmm. last. I mean, this is, this is a global problem. And it's, you know, it's a waste of many nations. And it's, it's, um, it, it, somebody's going to figure it out eventually. And um, waiting for that day. Oh, oh, well, on that hopeful note, <laughs> if there could be a hopeful note to end this conversation. Thanks very much, Robin. Yeah. Thank you for listening to us.